Why doesn't Nike sue the shoe surgeon? After all, they have no problem suing everybody else. A couple of weeks ago, I made a short video talking about the custom shoe surgeon boxing boots that Jake Paul wore in his fight against Nate Diaz. I asked you guys if you'd be interested in a video talking about the shoe surgeon and how he's seemingly immune from scrutiny from Nike. And so, here we are. In today's episode, we're gonna talk about the rise of sneaker customization over the past 10 years. We're gonna be talking about the sneaker customization rules, both written and unwritten. And we're gonna talk about how the shoe surgeon managed to get himself a pass and why he's been able to become so successful seemingly piggybacking Nike trademarks. If you guys like sneaker content, make sure you are subscribed to the channel. And if you do like the video at any point, feel free to hit the thumbs up for me. I really would appreciate it. Sneaker Customizing is a really interesting topic. It's become an integral part of the fabric of sneaker culture. Successful artists have become sneaker customizers and sneaker customizers have become artists. Firstly, let's talk about the rise of sneaker customization. Coming from a personal place, which is where all the thoughts and opinions of today's episode are coming from, it seems to me like about 10 years ago, sneaker customization started to become quite mainstream. One sneaker that I can remember really breaking the internet were the Dirty Breads. We first saw pictures of these in 2013, not long after the release of the 2012 Playoff 11s. And who would have thought that just a simple, subtle painting of the midsole black would set the internet on fire, get people producing YouTube tutorials. It was a crazy time for customizing. It kind of changed the way people perceived customs. Customizing, thanks to the Dirty Breads, was seen as a way of creating a shoe that we only wish Nike would make. So this era of fantasy shoes was born. Then came those Python Jordan 1s. And then Python was just being put on absolutely every shoe imaginable. And what this did to the shoe was it kind of elevated the look of the shoe. Crocodile or alligator or reptile skin on a shoe was always seen as something very luxurious. And it seems like Jordan brands took notice of these customization trends to the point where they themselves started to add really luxurious materials materials and crocodile skins with shoes like the Pinnacle series. And so customization had really caught fire to the point where even the big brands themselves were sort of piggybacking off that popularity. A lot of customizers out there I'm sure will tell you that they came up with colorways for shoes long before they ever became GRs. These days DIY customization is really popular, whether it's coffee dyeing or dip dyeing your sneakers, painting the midsoles, putting in big fat rope laces. Custom shoes are very very much part of the sneaker landscape these days, where they weren't 10 plus years ago. Right, so let's talk about some of the rules, some of the regulations around customizing and selling your custom sneakers. Nike allows the fair use doctrine for a transformative work of art. That is, you take the sneaker and you transform it and you sell it as a piece of art. Some legal experts have issues with this, some don't, because there is a gray area around what exactly constitutes art. When it comes to selling these custom sneakers, what you have to do is you have to sell the service and not the sneaker. In fact, if you go onto any reputable sneaker customizers website and you try to buy the shoes, they are going to mention specifically in the description that what you are paying for is the service. You're not buying the shoe, you're buying the service. A lot of other customizers have conditions where you actually buy the shoe and supply the shoe and they simply supply the labor and the labor is what you are paying for. And so that's one very important thing to mention. When you're selling custom shoes, you're not selling the shoes, you're selling the labor associated with creating the art. What you don't wanna do is what Drip Creations did a couple of years ago. They were apparently using counterfeit Air Force Ones, deconstructing the shoe, reconstructing it with third-party trademarks like for example, the Burberry pattern, and selling them ostensibly as genuine Nike products. According to Nike's claims in the lawsuits, Drip Creations is likely to cause confusion mistake and or create an erroneous association as to the source origin. And so it's this confusion created among the consumer markets and the dilution of the trademarks that's likely to get Nike's backs up. And suffice to say, Nike had their day in court with Drip Creations and they won. And if you wanna see what Drip Creations are up to now, all you have to do is jump over to their IG. So why is it that the shoe surgeon gets a pass? I mean, not only does he get a pass, he works together with Nike. 
and is seemingly allowed to make whatever he wants using Nike's highly treasured trademarks and logos, bring in other trademarks and logos from other brands, and then put his logo on it. It's like a logo fiesta on his sneakers these days. And the truth of the matter is that he gets away with it because he's in good with Nike. He's in good with Nike because he has become a huge name in the world of sneakers. The likelihood to cause confusion is minimal given the scope of his reputation. There's no confusing a shoe surgeon Nike with a regular Nike. His work provides incredible marketing for Nike. Because of his social accounts and because of the nature of the people that he's doing commissions for, Nike are scoring a ton of marketing points off the back of this guy on the regular. Next, he's incredibly well connected. He's done shoes for every big celebrity out there. In short, his reputation is good and Nike like to be associated with that. His work, generally speaking, is of a very high quality and standard, meaning the risk of trademark or brand dilution owing to poor quality or craftsmanship is very, very low. In fact, he would probably argue that his work actually elevates the status of the brand because people are paying out so much money for his Nikes. I mean, some of his Nikes have gone for up to a quarter of a million dollars. And if people are paying a quarter of a million dollars for a pair of Nikes, that reflects very well back on Nike. Next up, he's useful. If Nike want to do a last minute shoe for LeBron James, celebrating him becoming the NBA's leading all-time scorer, Nike don't need to get a design team together and send out an order to the Nike kitchen. They can just get the shoe surgeon to do it. And unlike Nike, where their production chain has a number of different moving parts and is going to require a lot of time to turn a shoe around, the shoe surgeon, because of his his own factory setup and because of his staffing on hand can produce this shoe in an absolute click of the fingers. And so these swift custom turnarounds combined with the high level of attention to detail mean that Nike know that they can call on the shoe surgeon to make any custom Nike they need. Now these of course are all just my opinions based on the research I've done and the people that I have spoken to. Absolutely no hate. I've got nothing but respect for the shoe surgeon and all of the sneaker customizing community out there I just wanted to shed a bit of light on this situation and hopefully after watching this video you are better edified for it let me know what you guys thought about this video in the comments always interested to hear your thoughts and I'll see you guys on the next one take care for now and peace